In the time of darkness, the deep blue black, the time of pole. From the life-giving slime, the stock began. Began in the spirit world, a world of gods, a world peopled by gods alone. The night became pearl. Born in this night was Kumulipo, source darkness, male. Born was Poele, night blackness, female. Born to them was Polili, darkness. Night followed night, and born to the darkness were the eternal spirits. This was the beginning of the earth. Born to the darkness was the coral, foundation of the earth. Born was the burrowing worm, hilling the soil. Born were invertebrates, Pea and Ina, the barnacles, mollusks, Opihi, the creatures that live in the sea and on land. Born were the plants, Ekaha and Taro. Born were the fishes of the sea and the animals that swam through the air. Born were the creeping things, the birds and the crawlers. Born was Pua'a, the night digger. Born were the nibblers and the dogs. Still, it was night. For such was the time of Po, when it was still dark. Tranquil was the time as night pressed on into day. It was called calmness then, when the wombs gave birth. So was born the ancestor of the race, and well-formed was the child, the first chief of the dim past who dwelt in the cold uplands. This was the time when men multiplied, when men came from afar, born of woman, of man, and of gods. They were born in the hundreds, and in ever-increasing numbers, in canoes hewn from upland trees. Man was here now. It was the time of Ao. It was day. Nearly all that is known of the origins of Hawaii's indigenous people is contained in clues gleaned from lyrical lines of epic chants that have passed, essentially intact, through millennia. Contained within this chanted poetry are genealogies of Hawaii's chiefly families, traceable in direct line, generation by generation, through their Polynesian ancestry, back to the creation of life itself. It, of course, did not have its genesis in Hawaii because too much of the history of the Polynesians as a, as a people, other than the Hawaiians, there's, you know, their cousins, the Tahitians, Marquesas, are in there. This is not a creation or this is not a genealogy strictly for the Hawaiians, but goes back maybe 3,000 years. You know, if we're drawing parallels or, or uh, looking at other things, it's very much like the Bible and the Old Testament. The Old Testament the main purpose was to establish one person's coming and so you went through who begat who and who begat what have you. It is the very age of the various creation chants that makes the scientific principles within them so remarkable. In their intimacy with nature, the Polynesians observed and classified animals and plants along with numerous subspecies. From this they concluded that all life forms ascended from the simplest to the most complex. And it is known that among Hawaiians, a concept of biological evolution was understood, accepted, and firmly established in their oral tradition, at least a century and a half before the appearance of Charles Darwin's The Origin of Species. But evolution, as contained in the Kumulipo, was not their only view of life and universe. 
All right, it's only one really of a number of creation myths or ideas. And the Hawaiians had all three of these. One, that the gods created him and created the universe, several of them, not just one. Or gods and goddesses who gave birth to them. That's the second idea, that everything had to be born. And the third is, of course, the Kuunipo idea, which is that everything came of itself. And if there is deity, deity is a process of that too. The gods evolved also. The entire universe was an orderly, uh, fixed uh, whole in which all the parts were integral to the whole, including man himself. Uh, man was descended from the gods, but so were the rocks, so were the animals, so were the fish. Thus, man had to regard uh, the, ro the rocks and the fish and the birds as his relatives. It's uh, an ecological point of view, which, uh, which Western man is only beginning to discover now, I think. Also contained within the ancient chants are great legends which trace Hawaiian ancestry to the earliest Polynesian seafarers. 2,000 years before the birth of Christ and 35 centuries before Columbus, mapless navigators set out from the oceans of the Asias and Indonesia on a voyage of exploration and settlement of tiny dots of land that lay sprinkled throughout 45 million square miles of Pacific Ocean. First, they traveled eastward and south before turning their canoes east again, where they may have rested a thousand years in the islands of Samoa and Tonga. It is thought that by the time of Christ, Polynesian canoes had reached New Zealand, Tahiti, the Marquesas, and by 200 AD, set out again, turning their canoes north and to windward to Hawaii. To ascertain the details of this first great Polynesian migration, contemporary historians and anthropologists turn to the genealogies and storylines found within ancient Oli, the chants that speak often of great heroes and deeds. So the history of the Polynesians as such is not seen as, well, this section belongs to the Tahitians, this one is for the Samoans, but rather it's the history of the migrations of a people from the Pacific across. And the thread of connection is seen through the lists of names which are held in common. We can take these genealogies apart, compare them to Samoan, compare them to Tahitian, and we can see where we have a common lineal ancestor at one point in the genealogy. Then we say, oh yes, we share that person. Many things were events, particular events. And in the Hawaiian mind's eye or, the, or anyone living in Polynesia, events were noted because they were above the ordinary. Okay, um, It would be the same in history anywhere else in the world. The events that come through historically will be like superhuman type of feats. On their journeys across the Pacific and to Hawaii, the Polynesians revealed a very human trait found in all great migrations, that of naming a new home for an old one. Because when you look at some of the older place names in Hawaii, you have a reflection of colonization. Uh, Tahiti Nui is on the big island of Hawaii, and that's one of the major, major districts in the, in the society islands. Uh, Upolu is an ancient name for some of the islands down there, and it's, there's Upolu up in, in Hawaii. Punaru'u is a, is a famous dis district in, in the Society Islands in Tahiti, and we have a Punaru'u here. The eventual name of the island group Hawaii'i is traceable to Hawaii'i, an ancient name for the island of Raiatea in Tahiti. There is also Hawaii'i in the Marquesan group, and further back we find the name Hava for what we now know as the Indonesian island of Java, believed the launching point of the great voyages. 
Most evidence credits Marquesan Islanders with the discovery of the Hawaiian chain somewhere between 300 and 500 AD. How they found it remains shrouded in mystery. First of all, I think that they discovered these Hawaiian Islands were purely accidental. A group of, perhaps a, a group of fishermen or, or a group of persons, uh, basically men, uh, were looking for something or going someplace and they could have been disabled or got caught in a storm and was a little bit off of their regular beaten path and they found themselves uh, eventually north of the equator. And one of the first things that they recognized almost immediately was there, there was a star up there that never moved. And that happens to be the North Star, Polaris. Uh, I suppose uh, several things could happen. Out of curiosity, they could have headed straight for the star and kept on going and, and eventually uh, uh, arrived here. Well, I think every discovery of new land is a fortuitous accident. But once here, being able to stand on these islands and watch the movement of stars overhead, they could then uh, fix the star paths in their mind and find their way back here again. So keen was their knowledge of the night sky that ancient Hawaiians, and presumably their Polynesian cousins, had identified the five earliest known planets, named collectively Na Hoku Aia, the wandering stars. And, more important for navigation, Na Hoku Pa'a, the fixed stars. But it was the intimate knowledge of one fixed star that made possible the so-called second migration of Polynesians to Hawaii, called Hokulea, star of gladness or happy star. Western man knows it as Arcturus. It's the zenith star. It appears to pass directly overhead of this island uh, in the night sky. And it will also appear to pass directly overhead at any point east or west, directly east or west of this island. Now, in sailing from Tahiti, if you want to hit this island, first of all, you must stay to windward of it. So you sail north, keeping to windward as much as possible until Hokulea appears directly overhead in the night sky, appears to pass over directly. Um, and then you turn downwind and sail directly west and you'll pick up this island. Very little is known about the first Hawaiian settlers, the Marquesans, how they lived or the state of their culture. So we tend to, and it's very understanding, tend to say, well, this is Hawaiian society and that's the way it always was even from the time that they arrived here and you often see depicted the first arrivals of the um, Hawaiians and the Hawaiian Islands on these large double canoes with the chief standing there with this big kahili and flowing feather cape. Well, probably nothing could be farther from the truth because I'm pretty sure that when they first came up here, there were not very many of them, and maybe not very many of them for an awfully long period of time in which everybody was pretty much equal. We can assume it was a Polynesian society led by chiefs um, with commoners along with them. There's probably no more than uh, three or four canoes in that first fleet so it would be a small group, but it would have been a uh, fully organized Polynesian society. Hi, hoi anu ino wa a, mai ka ikina. This chant offers one description of the first migration. It tells of voyagers who made landfall and settled in a remote valley, Halava, on the island of Molokai. The words speak of hardships endured, of ships lost at sea. It says only five canoes survived. Hoi 
The earliest Marquesan settlers found very little of the lushness we know in Hawaii today, very little to support life. What did exist was carried by wind, birds, and the sea. Uh, the first settlers who came found very little that was really nutritious and very delicious, although they found other plants and the like that were very important in their environment. So in the uh, canoes, the colonists brought, first of all, taro, because taro was the number one starch food. It was the number one food. Taro is of both practical and spiritual importance to Hawaiians, believed by many to be the origin of man himself, child of an early mating of the gods of creation, when Wakea, Sky Father, caused his sacred rain to fall upon Pa Pa, Earth Mother, and fertilized her. The taro plant is not only the source of food to the Hawaiians, but it's also a medicinal plant. And the taro plant is our hiapo. That is, taro plant is the eldest sibling of all of us Hawaiians, because in one of the matings of Bakia with Papa, it was a deformed product of that conception, and when it was placed in the ground, up sprouted the taro plant. A later mating of Wakea and Papa created Haloa, the first man, younger brother of the Taro. From Haloa are descended the Hawaiian people. This just represents the kind of connections we have to our own traditions, the kind of um, affinity we have for our, for our surroundings, and that we are all related to that first uh, brother, uh, Haloa, who came sprouting as a taro plant. So we relate it to the plants, to the soil, to the sky, to the water, to our whole world. As the taro grew and flourished in this new land, so did the people. The population seems to have doubled every hundred years or so. The people settled in the windward areas of the island chain, where there was a steady supply of fresh water to grow food easily and simply. The fish in this pristine environment were plentiful. Relative peace reigned for several hundred years. For some reason, the population which grew up here became uh, probably one that, that was uh, a little bit unruly after, after a great uh, expansion in population. And as a result, those persons who were of the of the priestly class found it necessary to go back to bring back some powerful chiefly people to these islands and to bring back some segment of or some semblance of, of order again. To many authorities, formalization of the ancient Hawaiian society began with the arrival of the great priest Pa'au. Believed to have come from Tahiti, some say the Samoas, Pa'au made landfall at Puna on the Big Island, about 1100 AD. There, he erected a great temple called Aheyo, which he named Wahaula, before proceeding up the coastline to Kohala, where he made his home. Not far from Kohala, at the northwest point of the island, Pa'au built the great Heiau of Mo'okini, among the largest and oldest ever found in Hawaii. Legends say Mo'okini was built of stones passed by hand, man to man, from Niuli'i, a feat requiring at least 15,000 men, standing three feet apart over a distance of nine miles. 
at Mo'okini Heiau, Pa'au officiated, and, according to legends contained in the ancient chants, introduced Wald Heiau. Red feathers worn as a sign of rank, prostrating before high-ranking chiefs, and other extreme practices and rituals that served to institutionalize the power and status of chiefs and priests. It is said that he brought the, the, the great temple drum, he brought the, uh, possibly the institution of human sacrifice. Um, what this shows is that he brought the classical uh, Polynesian culture that had developed in, in uh, the Tahiti area uh, during the t between the time that Hawaii was first discovered and, and the time that adventurers started sailing out from Raiatea and, and Bora Bora and the Leeward Society Islands. The arrival of Pa'au marked the beginning of comprehensive change and contributed in large part to shaping what we think of today as ancient Hawaiian society. It was then a second wave of migrations began, this time from Tahiti. The epic chants, the Oli, chronicle journeys of many groups which came up from the south. A calculated transplanting of an entire culture took place during this series of voyages. The migrants brought their chanted memories, the accumulated knowledge of their history, personalities, laws, customs, and instructions in the design and use of tools for fishing and agriculture. All of this knowledge was transmitted in the spoken word of the Poe Mo'olelo, the history person or historian, who'd been trained to store the entirety of his culture and the genealogies of his chiefs in his memory. For centuries, the canoes traversed the 3,000 miles to and from Tahiti, relying on virtually all natural phenomena for navigation. They used prevailing ground swells to keep their bearings during the day, until Nahukupa'a, the fixed stars, could confirm their location at night. The flight of the migratory birds, the patterns of the winds and the currents, all served to guide these ancient mariners. Long journeys by sea were so extensive that even today, the channel off the tip of the Hawaiian island of Kaho'olawe is called Keala Ikahiki, the path to Tahiti. The seafarers brought their families, their wives and children, and domestic animals, dogs, pigs, and chickens. They built homes that were simple, but adequate structures for the climate, made of bark and wood, with coconut fronds and pili grass used for thatching. Eating houses were separate, one for men and one for women. I, mahalo. They also brought wauke, the paper mulberry plant from which the women pounded out the kapa, or tapa cloth, for fiber, cordage, and clothing. To the rhythm of the tapa chant, they made the material for pa'u, short skirts for themselves, and malo, loincloths for their men, or the kihei, the cloak worn by all. They brought many plants which became staples of the Hawaiian diet. Yams, sweet potatoes, coconut, mountain apples, bananas, sugar cane, and one of the most remarkable transplants of this or any time. 
we have the legend of Kahai, who brought breadfruit here. And because that's, he landed at Kualoa, uh, in, in, uh, at Kaneohe Bay, Oahu, where Hokulea came back. And, and uh, we have that legend, so it must have been an important event. Breadfruit is a very difficult plant to, to uh, transplant even from one yard to the next. It has to be transplanted as a living tree. Uh, to carry it over 3,000 miles of seawater, which is deadly to plant tissues, and keep it alive is an ag agricultural feat of no small order. Uh, yet they were able to do it, and they chronicled it in their legends. Everything in nature was revered, and much of the respect they showed appeared in their fine arts and adornments. Necklaces of shell, bone, teeth of shark or dogs, were worn about their necks or as anklets in celebration of their dances. Intricately woven feather capes and helmets for the great chiefs or li'i were painstakingly acquired without harm to the birds who provided them. And flowers in abundance were woven as crowns for their heads about their necks as bracelets or anklets. They saw beauty in all that surrounded them and they embraced it. Ah, aloha i kawe, mauna loe. Aloha, aloha i kawe, mauna loa. This dance tells of the beauty of Mauna Loa on Molokai, of the sacred lehua blossom, famous for the lei, of the great forests of Ohia, from which canoe makers got their logs, and of rushing springs and streams that fed the glistening seas of Hale Olono. <laughs> As the population flourished, its survival could be assured only if there were enough to eat. This required social order and an agreed-upon method of protective control of the food supply. To this end, Hawaiians turned to an ancient Polynesian system of social control known as tabu, kapu in Hawaiian, which translates as forbidden, sacred, or separate. The Polynesian custom was adapted in Hawaii and became a sort of common law. It set apart as kapu fixed rules of religious and civil behavior towards gods, chiefs and priests, one another, and to nature. And the force which held it together was mana, the life force, the spiritual essence of all creation. If you were to say there's an equivalent to the concept of God being omni, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, this would be it. More so than the four Polynesian or the four uh, Hawaiian major gods equal Jehovah. Uh-uh. The Christian God equals mana. I mean, if we were really to analyze it. And mana is strictly this. Whatever made the universe be, whatever made it alive, and whatever made it take the form in which we see it today, it may take other forms, whatever. It has always to be there. And their central belief was that every person was in lokahi, or harmony, with himself and with others and with everything in nature. And everything in nature was not only alive, but also conscious and communicating, which means they did not distinguish between what we now distinguish between animate and inanimate. To Hawaiians, everything in the cosmos was alive. And not, uh, not only alive, but conscious, that is, able to perceive and therefore able to communicate. So Hawaiians of old, just as many of us Hawaiians today, still talk to the wind and the ocean and the mountains and the trees and the water in the streams, as well as to the birds and animals. Uh, they had no word for a religion. And what does that tell us? It tells us that it pervaded 
so much of their everyday life, religious thought pervaded every waking moment of their life, that there was no thinking of it as a separate thing, as something you only do on Sunday. Uh, uh, again, that springs from their worldview, from their idea of the creation. I suppose when you live on an island and your entire existence, whether you're going to survive, whether you're going to live, whether you're going to die, is dependent on the natural forces around you. Uh, whether you have enough rain to supply the fields of taro growing or the ulu or whatever, whether the oceans are calm enough and that the fish are plentiful, then obviously your respect for these forces are going to grow, which was the case of the Hawaiians. They knew that they would not eat if things turned against them. So what happened, and as it developed, were the gods and goddesses that controlled these forces. They became paramount in their existence. So the connections were there. The Hawaiian knew that the natural forces which affected all that surrounded him were the very forces that created him. He was inseparable from his universe, inseparable from all that was sacred. Life forces could take many forms. The wind, kamakani, the sun, kala. And life forces could only be influenced by the gods, the only absolute possessors and dispensers of mana, who, like the life forces, could take many forms. Of the four major Hawaiian gods, the numerous secondary gods and perhaps 400,000 lesser gods, among the most visible and understandable today is Pele, temperamental and jealous. From her present home at Kilauea Caldera on the island of Hawaii, Pele will take whatever she chooses, should she choose, and destroy everything in a fiery swath to venge her wrath. But like all life forces, like gods and nature, Pele is dualistic. She is the very creator of these islands. As she destroys, she creates. Vistas of extraordinary black and beauty, in which at times a single flower will burst forth. Her flower, the lehua blossom, the first life that sprouts from her cooled lava. Hawaiians honored their deities at Heiau, stone temples where priests, kahuna, conducted sacred rites, recited the genealogies of their chiefs, and chanted praises to whichever god the Heiau sanctified. As temples of gods, Heiau were places of great mana, mana which was protected by ritualistic kapu. As there were places of mana, there were times of mana. The chant speaks of the setting sun, of dusk, a time of quiet, most favored by the gods. As the Ali'i receive their mana directly from the gods, the exquisite peace found at evening was reserved for them. Oh, 
aku galui wahyai. Although mana existed in all life, the highest born, the chiefs or li'i, as direct descendants of the gods, could, by implication, claim the greatest amount of mana, and enormous deference was accorded them. It was kapu, forbidden, to step within the shadow of an ali'i, or to allow one's own shadow to fall upon an ali'i. To do so might steal his mana, and violation of this kapu meant almost certain death. To protect their people from accidentally breaking this kapu, a conch was blown to announce the imminent arrival of an ali'i. Thus alerted, a commoner had time enough to move out of the way or prostrate himself so no shadow could fall. The rules of kapu both separated the classes and bound them together. Ritualized laws of behavior and obligation assigned a place for each person and protected that place. As keepers of knowledge, chanters of the sacred genealogies, and protectors of the rites at Heiyau, the priestly class claimed the second greatest amount of mana. The kahuna was the, uh, was, you might say, the, the, the man who uh, taught the people. There were four, there were several, many different kinds of kahuna who were, uh, you might say, uh, specialized in different arts, different occupations, who taught, you might say, the people in their various uh, 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 occupations and various ways of life. For example, we, what we call the kahuna lapa'au, la'au, was a man who was uh, uh, medicine, in medicine. We have the, uh, uh, the kahuna lawai'a, was a man who taught fishing. Uh, we have the uh, 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 kahuna mahi'ai, which was a man who taught farming and so forth. The kahuna and the ali'i directed the work of the class beneath them, the commoners, the maka'ai na na. The maka'ai na na were the doers, the fishermen and the farmers. They had many couple to observe. They were strict in terms of what fish to catch. For example, during the makahiki, you did not catch the, the aku and the ahi, but you ate the opello and the akuli in terms of it. Um, kapus like that no longer exist. In, in terms of eating various um, bananas or various uh, uh, agricultural products, because of the season in which they were dormant or the, because of the season in which they were, were ready for the harvest. This is another way of maintaining a certain, a certain degree of excellence in their, in their foodstuffs. And what I, what I feel about this is that they developed it, it to a, such a high degree that they didn't forage for their food. They, they developed a plantation effect. Two of the very popular food fish were the aku and the opelu. And we have a feeling that the old folks studied the breeding habits of the fish. And they decided that the opelu uh, laid their eggs and so forth uh, during the first half of the year, according to our calendar, January to June or July. So during that time, the fisher folk uh, caught aku, but they didn't touch the opelu. Then came July, and they let the Aku go about their uh, matrimonial affairs, and they caught the Opelu. Kapu prevented ancient Hawaiians from depleting their food sources. There were also Kapu that required prayers and offerings to appropriate God forces to ensure a favorable outcome in their endeavors. He usually didn't say to Kuula, Give me a good catch today. He would say, uh, I would like to appeal to you to have the fish multiply and be abundant. I would like to appeal to you to have fish come into our area. It was, there's, there's a difference in a seemingly greedy attempt to have lots of fish. No, he wanted nature to work sort of in his direction, you see. And that was kind of a nice one. And then when he came back in, he either brought the first fish of his catch and put it at Kula, or he might bring the first one of each kind 
Velika. The whole thing was uh, with its religious overtones. And I believe in that because uh, if you are saying your little prayers to the gods, that causes you to be sincere. And you look over your bait and your lines and your hooks and you go out with the right attitude. And you, by the way, tell your wife while you're out fishing, don't gossip <laughs> at home. Uh -huh. Ecological awareness among Hawaiians is seen not only in conservation kapu, but within a sophisticated system of land division and agricultural technology. Land was distributed in Ahu Pua'a, often pie-shaped sections incorporating a complete valley from the mountain to the sea, assuring its occupant access to fishing, agricultural plots of taro and other lowland crops, and products from higher forest elevations. The Ahu Pua'a were virtually self-sufficient. Controlled by ali'i, lesser chiefs or land managers the Ahu Pua'a were worked by Maka'ai Nana, who supported their chiefs with its produce, but who also held ready access to its bounty. They were sophisticated in their planting. They were sophisticated in their aquaculture. Um, in the sophistication of their planting, you had many varieties of bananas, my ah, you had many varieties of sweet potatoes, you had many varieties, you have over 300 varieties of, of taro or kalo. Masterfully terraced taro gardens were fed by elaborate irrigation systems which maximized the conservation of fresh water, an achievement found nowhere else in Polynesia. The water goes down through the terraces very gradually so that the um, uh, the water doesn't heat up from the sun and rot the taro, and, but not so fast that the water would erode the terraces. You wouldn't want that to happen. So the irrigation system, the ditches that they built, the aoi that they built, would control the, the speed of the water. And the amount of the water would be controlled by the type of dam that you put up and so you can control, it's a method of controlling water and getting what you need, where you need it, when you need it. So this uh, is a big um, engineering project and, I'm, and they did it. <laughs> they were very good at it. The skill and engineering demonstrated in the terraces and irrigation systems were also present in the design, development and success of an early an unparalleled form of aquaculture. The Hawaiians were the only Pacific Islanders that made shoreline fish ponds. So those are really artifacts, and they were really the ice boxes for the people. For when the weather was inclement and they couldn't go fishing, they could go to the fish ponds and dip up the fish that they needed. We do think that the chiefs did a little more dipping into the fish ponds than the Maka'ainana, but at least if the chiefs got their fish out of their ponds, that let the Maka'ainana go out and have greater use of the fish in the open bay or open sea. What you really have is, it's like a, like a pasture. You have a pasture in which you create the environment, the best environment that you can for growing algae. And the more algae you have, the more food you have for the fish, and that's very attractive to the fish to come in and have all this food growing there. And, uh, and then they get fat, and then they can't go out the same way they came in because they're too fat now. And so um, the, it's really very ingenious of the Hawaiians to have selected the herbivore link to raise in their fish ponds. You look at some of the monumental things that were structured like uh, like some of the heyels and some of the fish ponds. When you look at that kind of work, you wonder, at least I wonder, and say, boy, to do that back-breaking work, to haul the rocks all the distances they had to, really required some kind of discipline. 
if you didn't have discipline, you would have had revolution. And revolution was almost non-existent, so far as I know, in the Hawaiian society. Artists, scientists, poets, craftsmen, fishermen, farmers, hula dancers, each had his place and his duties in Hawaiian society. And generation upon generation, those skills were passed on through an oral transmission from the kahuna and the poet, trained in the skills of memory. In truth, the very survival of the Hawaiians depended on the accurate storage and retrieval of their accumulated knowledge, kept within the lines of precisely memorized oli, or chants. Chant was life, because the language was life. The way you communicated was through the language. We well, had a lot of body language too, but still, there was so much in the word, the famous proverb, in the word is life, in the word is death. That carries the whole concept of mana, power. Certain words, certain chants had so much power. They were used for such a long time. They became so sacred, so couple, that um, they could, to the Hawaiian, in their belief, change a life or uh, start a life or end a life. The chanted poetry of the Oli was delivered in long, sustained phrases, sometimes using only two pitches, sometimes more. There are six major styles of chanting, all of which required certain pitches, voice qualities, and methods of delivery. There were some very particular things that Hawaiian chanters did. One was to hold the voice entirely up in the throat. They didn't sing from down here, as an opera singer would, or the way one is taught to sing in the Western way is, use your chest, use your diaphragm. The Hawaiian chanters uh, placed their voice in the throat. They had a lot of tension created. A very small area uh, was used to project one's voice. They chanted at a relatively high level. They chanted in what's called a kind of a mid-register. It's not a chest and it's not a head. A head register would be something that's called falsetto. But this is right in between. There's a lot of crea uh, tension created in the sound that way. There were over 100 terms describing types of chants according to their purposes. The voice quality was determined by the function of the chant. Oli could free someone from kapu express sorrow, declare love, praise a hero, or a great feat, in addition to maintaining the history of an individual or family. And each function required a certain unique way of chanting. And all of these are related to the general styles and they're related to the functions. So you will not do an uh, a ho'u uwe uwe, which is a style of wailing, using various particular voice qualities in that for a love chant or for a praise chant or a name chant because functionally a praise chant does not require wailing you have to go to a uh, lamentation a kaniko <laughs> How reliable are the chants as sources of history? In order to answer that, one has to answer the question of why they did not have writing. And they did not have writing, I believe, because the word was so important. The words itself had power. And, and one, if one put words into writing and distributed it, then anyone could have that power, including those who were not worthy of it. So, so uh, knowledge was kept um, to those who were deemed worthy, worthy of it. The Hawaiians had, would penalize their orators with death in some instances if they did not, or if they missed a line in public oratory. So I would say that you could more or less trust that what, they, what we have is 
uh, a lot of attention has been given to try to keep keep these traditions intact. There was a reverence for the word. Uh, we know that some of their chants would last an entire day and had to be word perfect in order for the chant to work, uh, to invoke uh, a, the help of a particular uh, spirit. So there was a reverence for the word which suggests to me that that the words did not change very much over, over the centuries, that, that they were kept uh, carefully. The feudal society built by ancient Hawaiians appears, on the surface, strict, inhibiting, brutal at times. Yet, the precision of its oral tradition, even its kapu, found the Hawaiians at the zenith of their culture, virtually disease-free, and prosperous. It's very easy for us who grew up in a different kind of so a society to, to make a comparison of that society to us and, and end up saying, boy, that was an unjust society. If you had to live at that time, you would probably have found it a very just society. And that's the way I'd like to look at it. At once just and harsh, sophisticated, complex, self-sufficient, and self-contained. The society created by ancient Hawaiians by the middle of the 18th century achieved a cultural, economic, and technological peak unrivaled in Polynesia. It worked. Yet, at its very height, a new voice was heard that rose above the chanted memories of the people. In the words of the prophet, Keaulumoku came a new chant, clouded at first in its imagery. But as time passed, its message grew painfully clear. This chant foresaw the coming of the white man, the death of the royal line, suppression of the ancient religion, gods and goddesses, the disappearance of most things Hawaiian. A challenge, too, was left to the Hawaiian people. Au a ia e tama, e tonamoku, o tonamoku e tama, e au a ia. Hold fast, child, to your land, to your land, child, hold fast. Na na ia la bebe, da ho.
bearing northeast by east, and soon after we saw more land bearing north, entirely detached from the first. On the beach at Waimea, Kauai, a man named Moapu was fishing. Hawaiian historian Samuel Kamakau later translated his eyewitness account. We were out fishing and saw a strange thing move by and lights on board. We hurried ashore to tell Ka'il and the other chiefs of Kauai. Chiefs and commoners saw the wonderful sight. Some were terrified and shrieked with fear. One asked the other, what are those branching things? And the other answered, there are trees moving about on the sea. As the resolution and discovery approached Kauai, the isolation that created a uniquely Hawaiian culture came to an end. This was the moment of cultural collision, the moment of contact. We were in some doubt whether or no the land before us was inhabited. This doubt was soon cleared up by seeing some canoes coming off the shore towards the ship. We saw men on the ship with white foreheads, sparkling eyes, and long heads, who spoke a strange language and breathed fire from their mouths and who had much iron lying about on their floating heiau. As there were some venereal complaints on both ships, I gave orders that no women on any account whatever were to be admitted on board the ships. And I ordered that none who had the venereal upon them should go out of the ships. Yet I am much afraid that before long island women took to sleeping with foreigners to obtain cloth iron and mirrors and a fateful damage was done during cook's second visit in 1779 at keala kikua bay the lack of understanding between the cultures resulted in tragedy in trying to recover a stolen boat, the English became involved in a fight with Chief Kalani Opu'u and his men. Cook was killed. The foreigners soon left, but their influence was just beginning to test the strength of Hawaii's spiritual and cultural uniqueness. Could Hawaiians withstand the seed sown in Cook's initial year of contact? Gonorrhea, syphilis, prostitution, alcohol, tobacco, fleas, centipedes, scorpions, mosquitoes, epidemics, and firearms. First to recognize the advantages foreigners could bring to warfare was the nearly seven foot tall favorite nephew of Kalani Opu'u, Kamehameha of Kohala. While others prostrated themselves before the foreigners, Kamehameha's quick mind recognized a superior technology which could give him an edge over the other chiefs. In 1791, using the cannon and rifle, he launched a campaign to unify the islands. The success of Kamehameha may be in large part attributed to the fact that he controlled major ports and major sources of provisions. Kealakakua Bay, Kailua Bay, Kauaihai Bay. And so he had access to visiting uh, ships. He got himself into the provisioning business in a big way and he was able to get firearms. Uh, whereas chiefs of other parts of this island were not so fortunate. They didn't have the harbors. Kamehameha's decisive campaign for the islands ended dramatically on Oahu at the Nu'uanupali, where remnants of the defenders either scattered in the hills 
or fell a thousand feet to their deaths. 14 years would elapse before Kaua'i would enter the fold, but the conquering of Oahu in 1810 marked the unification of the Hawaiian Kingdom. In peace as in war, Kamehameha guided his young nation as he ruled himself, with strict adherence to traditional society. He governed justly, according to custom, ruling his kingdom from his taro patches at Kohala. He died at Kailua, the last of the traditional kings, the last great ali'i. In the early 18th century, many Hawaiians were going out on sailing ships, working on sailing ships all over the world and coming back to Kamehameha with stories that out there were continents swarming with millions of people. And the ruling chiefs uh, became very much aware that they were really a very small part of this world. And it bothered them. They knew that they would have to establish parity with Europe uh, and win some recognition from Europe. Uh, or if they didn't, uh, they would be devoured by the first European power that decided to uh, make a conquest of these islands. Ultimately, commerce served to undo traditional kingship and traditional society. In the early 1800s, Pacific fur traders learned of the existence of sandalwood here. Knowing the high prices the fragrant wood could bring, they descended on the islands. Well, of course, they represented commercial exploitation or capitalism. That is, seeking material goods in order to gain profit so that one could, oneself, gain more material possessions, which, of course, was very foreign to Hawaiians. And their whole existence was not based on the profit individual motive, but rather group affiliation and sharing. So we have cultural clash. A veritable rape of the forest ensued. The people labored endlessly with no reward, neglecting their crops at the direction of the chiefs. They were reduced to eating herbs and fern trunks because there was no food to be had. There was famine, there was disease, and many died. Meanwhile, the chiefs lavished themselves with everything from European clothing to billiard tables, payable in sandalwood. By 1826, Hawaiian chiefs were in debt to the foreign traders. Too many Hawaiians, anyway, quickly acquired this desire for material possessions, and especially the chiefs. And that was a major factor in the erosion of the political and social and economic structure of the old society. Within a few years, sandalwood was gone, and Hawaii's economic dependence quickly shifted to whaling. That industry brought prosperity and revitalized harbor activity in Lahaina, Hilo, and Honolulu. But it brought more foreigners, and it took many Hawaiian men away on ships, further depleting the population. It also continued to change the Hawaiian world. The mana of the white man of uh, Western civilization that was seen in the form of the ships, uh, cannons, uh, iron tools, uh, and so forth, um, challenged the mana of the Hawaiian. And the Hawaiians were smart enough to see that there was a great deal more power in uh, some of the technology some of the new ways that uh, Cook and um, other visitors uh, brought with them. When the, the Hawaiians met these people from overseas, they would sit down and talk to them. They would ask them questions about the world they didn't know, and the foreigners would give them answers. And inevitably, these uh, answers were, uh, had an influence on the, on the uh, eventual behavior of the Hawaiians. I don't say that they uh, were the predominant influence. They simply, they were taking in a great deal of information. 1819 was a pivotal year. 
the great chief Kamehameha died to be succeeded by his son, Liholiho. This marked the end of the old ways. First to fall to make way for the new ways was the ancient Hawaiian social structure, the kapu system. Liholiho, at the direction of the dowager queen, Ka'ahumanu, caused a feast to be prepared at Kailua, where the young king seated himself in the vacant place at the women's table and began to eat. The kapu was broken. He ordered Heiau destroyed and carved god images burned. This destroyed the entire framework of traditional government with nothing to replace it right away. So in 1819, uh, a very close-knit society with close-knit rules, a society that was functioning, had functioned for a long time, defined the way people thought about themselves, was simply destroyed all at once. In a remarkable coincidence of history, as Hawaiian society began to unravel from within, an evangelical revival spread over Europe and America, spurring waves of missionaries whose sole purpose was to save the heathen from himself. The Reverend Hiram Bingham. Little did any of the actors in the drama imagine that the measures they attempted were preparing for the introduction of a spiritual and holy religion. How conspicuous the wisdom and goodness of God to have provided a Christian mission for these islands at this auspicious moment. The European world of, say, the 1820s, 30s, and 40s saw their own way as the only way. And so native peoples who were not like Europeans uh, should be changed and should be improved. Armed only in the zealous belief that their work was wholly for the good of others and the glory of God, a pioneer company of missionaries, teachers, craftsmen, three American-educated Hawaiians, and one doctor set sail for Hawaii. March 31st, 1820, at Kailua Kuna, the missionaries encountered the first of their intended converts. The appearance of destitution, degradation, and barbarism among the chattering, almost naked savages was appalling. Some in our number, with gushing tears, turned away from the spectacle. Can these be human beings? Can such beings be civilized? Can they be Christianized? Can we throw ourselves upon these rude shores and take up our abode for life among such a people for the purpose of training them for heaven? To Hawaiians, the missionaries provided a humorous spectacle. White women, dressed with puritanical modesty, were quickly tagged long necks because of their high collars. But the missionaries were given a one-year trial by Liholiho, allowing them time to observe Hawaiians. The missionaries <clears throat> were horrified when they were here long enough to really get in command of the situation. Here were grown men out in the surf at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Now back in New England, we worked during the day and in the evening perhaps we uh, played games. So one of the missionaries said to a chief, why are you wasting your time and energy uh, on games this time of day? And the chief looked at him and said, we build our houses, we cultivate our fields out of necessity. We play our games because our hearts are in them. <laughs> Just as wasteful of time to the missionary mind was music and dance. In the hula, the dancers are often fantastically decorated with figured or colored kappa, green leaves, fresh flowers, and sometimes on the ankle, hundreds of dog's teeth. Much of the person is uncovered. Melody and harmony are scarcely known to them. The whole arrangement of their hulas were designed to promote lasciviousness. Work of the mission proceeded slowly. Preaching, or pule, attracted some attention. But without a written Hawaiian language, teaching was difficult. In 1822, the missionary William Ellis arrived from Tahiti 
fluent in that language. He greatly assisted the American mission in reducing the similar Hawaiian language into sounds they themselves could understand. In the process, irrevocable decisions were made. Well, it changed uh, the pronunciation of the language. For example, by show of hands, they decided that we were going to have an L and not an R, that we were going to have K, but not a T. In January, 1822, at the mission houses in Honolulu, lead type was set to form the page of a rudimentary speller. The pull of the hand lever then created the Hawaiian language's earliest imprint. Within a few years, the Bible too was translated, and it was used to teach Hawaiians their own language in written form. By the 1840s, Hawaii ranked among the most literate nations in the world. Letters, writings, and publications from the period are the only written clues to the ancient Hawaiian language. Well, the missionaries, of course, gave us their religion, and they gave us also a new language because they recorded our language made certain changes in it, some important, profound changes in our language, and in a sense, therefore, gave us a new culture. We, be, we became westernized and progressively de -Hawaiianized. One product of missionary education was a young Hawaiian man born in the 1790s and educated at Lahaina Luna School. Hawaiian historian David Malo saw what was coming and feared for his people during this time of transition. In a private letter to Kina'u, premier under Kamehameha III, he writes in 1837, If a big wave comes in, large fishes will come from the dark ocean which you never saw before. And when they see the small fishes, they will eat them up. The ships of the white men have come, and smart people have arrived from the great countries. They know our people are few in number and living in a small country. They will eat us up. In order to deal with the Western governments who are coming in and pressuring you folks to um, you pay up your bills and um, do this and do that, uh, in order to deal with those Western governments, you had to create a government of your own that was Western in shape and form and content so that you could deal with them. There was a tremendous rush um, on the part of the ruling chiefs, the chiefly families, to become as Westernized as quickly as possible. And historians haven't really understood the motive for this. They have poked fun perhaps at the idea of a, a Hawaiian chief wearing a malo and a top hat. Uh, what they really haven't uh, uncovered was the basic reason for this rush to become uh, westernized. And it was, uh, I believe, uh, an urgent need to establish parity with Europe for, uh, for Hawaii's own survival. Hawaii's first constitution in 1840 incorporated these western concepts establishing Kamehameha III as the first westernized Hawaiian monarch. The Constitution created a Bill of Rights, a legislative body chosen by the people, and a Supreme Court. The running of a western-style government required experience the king found only in foreign advisors with which he surrounded himself. Men such as the Minister of the Interior, Former American missionary Jarrett P. Judd, Scotsman Robert C. Wiley, who was appointed Minister of Foreign Relations, and American John Record, who served as Attorney General. In reaching for what seemed good for his people, Kamehameha III could not foresee the long-term consequences of his actions. 
It was not long before Hawaiian people began expressing concern at the pervasive influence of these foreigners in their government. Hawaiian historian Samuel Kamakau in 1845 records the apprehensions of some older Hawaiians. The king has chosen foreign ministers, foreign agents. This is wrong. Hawaiian people will be trodden underfoot by the foreigners. Entertaining foreigners is the beginning which will lead to the government coming into the hands of the foreigner and the Hawaiian people becoming their servants to work for them. Let chiefs fill the vacancies and do not let all of the government positions go to the hands of the foreigner. See, the excuse given by the monarchs in the early and even the later years was, oh, we don't have people who are trained to become, for example, uh, minister of the interior or to become uh, minister of education or to become minister of health. But no serious attempt was made to train and educate people to take these positions. Of greater concern to Hawaiians was the increasing foreign demand for land ownership, a concept basic to the Western mind. Interestingly, the Hawaiian language did not include a word for the phrase private property ownership. Uh, the people knew that that, that they lived under a ruling chief, and the ruling chief had the responsibility of making land available to everybody under his, under his domain, see. Uh, land was not a commodity of exchange or sale. It was, a, it, it was, it was something that some, so every, everyone needed to subsist and to survive, you see. No one owned the land privately. It was not their private domain. And it's very interesting that, um, uh, you know, the reason for this is that, that the land was set here by the gods. So no one would presume to own anything that the gods had set forth, uh, created. The Constitution of 1840 did little to address the growing land issue, other than to clarify that the land was in the care of the king. But in the 1830s, he began granting permission to sugar planters to start experimental crops. First, to Ladd and Company on Kauai. This marked the beginning of a new and potentially rich industry. But the planters, unable to buy or lease the land, could not justify the heavy capital investments they were anxious to make. So, the clamor was on to reform the land system to provide for fee simple ownership. In a flurry of correspondence with the king during the year 1845, Hawaiian subjects from throughout the kingdom expressed concern over the increasing foreign desire for land. Historian David Malo translates one petition from the Haina. Foreigners come on shore with cash ready to purchase land. But we have not the means to purchase lands. The native is disabled, like one who has long been afflicted with a disease on his back. If you, the chiefs, decide immediately to sell land to foreigners, we shall immediately be overcome. We, to whom the land has belonged from the beginning, shall all dwindle away. Fueling the movement were the missionaries, who believed that the Hawaiian people could not be truly independent and self-supporting unless they were released from the bondage of laboring for the chiefs and could acquire a vested interest in the property on which they lived and worked. Give the land to the people. Let each man have his little farm. Uh, owning it, he would improve it and become a good uh, yeoman farmer of the new Hawaiian nation. That was the king's intent. That was the intent of the policy makers. Uh, do good for the people. Uh, relieve them of the burdens of feudal service. You know, relieve them of their responsibilities to the chiefs. 
that was good, but you also relieve them from the protection of the chiefs. And you, you severed the mutually beneficial bonds between elements of society at that point. The Mahele of 1848, or the Great Mahele, as it is often called, was the king's answer to the pressing problem of land reform. The word Mahele means portion or division. On January 27, 1848, the lands were divided, with 2.5 million acres going to the king and 1.5 million to the chiefs. The king declared 1.5 million acres of his land as government lands, administered by the legislature. And 1 million acres he reserved for himself, calling them crown lands. Awards to the 250 chiefs were registered in this Mahele book and signed by the king. It was these lands the commoners were allowed to make claims against through the Kuleana Act of 1850. To get that land, a commoner had to come forward and prove his family had been living on and cultivating that plot. It sounded simple, an ideal solution in theory, but it was a radical departure from the Hawaiian reality. The whole concept, the whole notion of owning land was foreign, so many Hawaiians did not even understand why you had to go and get a piece of paper to say that you own that land, because for generations their family had cultivated the land, and everyone knew that they were the people who lived on that land. That land was theirs. Their ancestors were buried in the land. Their bones are in the land. So what more? Why, why do you need a piece of paper when you have your bones in the land to prove your ownership? From Napo'opo'o on the Big Island, in 1852, a Hawaiian subject writes to the land commissioners. We are those who have kulianas in the land bought by the foreigner P. Cummings the one who purchased Vaipuna Ula. The foreigner is saying that the natives have no rights to his land, none whatsoever. But these people are the ones who have rights granted them by Kamakau and Pili and have witnesses. We look anxiously to receiving help so that we may live on our lands comfortably. Love to you, God grant you life. Many Hawaiians, however, many commoners, did not even apply for the land because um, they had to make their claim against their chief. And they were intimidated in many cases from doing that. It took a lot of courage to tell the chief who you had lived under and who you believed to be a god, a living god, to say that you had the right to claim some land away from that chief. What followed was a nightmare for the Hawaiian people. The land had to be surveyed before an award was granted. That required money, which Hawaiians did not have. Property was taxed, not in goods and services, but in dollars. To get money for taxes and surveys, many people left their land to get jobs in town or aboard ships. While they were away, their land was often adversely possessed or simply absorbed by a neighboring owner. Now after the great Mahele, land then became a, a marketable commodity. It was never a marketable commodity before that. And as a result of that, many Hawaiians who couldn't, who couldn't survive in, in, in the commodity market eventually didn't have any lands to, to live on, you see. I think this is one of the, in my mind, it is one of the greatest evils foisted upon that society at that time. The chiefs were also selling off their land to foreigners, and the commoners working those lands were turned out, becoming wanderers or contract laborers, passive victims of the new system. Others were dispossessed through favoritism and interference by chiefs and land agents. A letter to the Minister of the Interior describes the plight of residents of Kaupo, East Maui. We humbly complain to you. Dismiss John T. Gower, our land agent. It is not right that when we offer to buy our own lands, 
that he should sell them to foreigners. We offered up to three dollars. The foreigner offered three dollars and got it. It was a swindle and a lie. The law states that the residents have first choice. And if it is not taken up, then sell to the outsider. He is angry, and we are afraid. And so the great division became the great dispossession. For in the final analysis, of over four million acres distributed in the Mahele, less than 29,000 acres actually went to the common people. Land equal in size to the smallest Hawaiian island, Kaho'olawe. 70% of the Hawaiian population was left with no land at all. They were there, they'd been used to having water rights, used to growing up in the mountains, getting timber and thatch and all that. But when they were given just a kuleana, they were more or less fenced in by that. So that system did not work. It was prompted by the merchants and the would-be plantation owners and all who wanted lots of land. So the Hawaiians found themselves almost landless. One of the th reasons why the Westerners said that the Hawaiians should own their own lands and become farmers, independent farmers, was, they said, because they were beholden to the chief all the time. They always had to do what the chief said to do, and they had to pay him taxes. And, of course, their idea was that if you get and give the farmer his own land, then he's no longer beholden to the chief. But that isn't what really happened because he got his pasture land taken away from him. And uh, also, um, uh, many of the people didn't get land, and it made them more beholden to the chiefs than ever before. They had uh, to, in, in essence, sell themselves as kids kind of a slavery, really, sell themselves to the chiefs in order to have a place to live. Most times it meant they had to move away from their families and live in the city, in the port town, away from their rural areas, but most importantly away from their ohana, their family system. And so the mahele meant uh, the breaking up of that cohesive family unit, that, well, which was the extended family system. The foreigners profited by the arrangement and were well taken care of by the government. It was the race who owned the government who were not defended. Of our Hawaiian people, 651 sailed for the east on foreign ships. Many are unaccounted for. At Papeete in Tahiti, there were over 400 Hawaiians. In Oregon, 500. At Paita in Peru, 50. And many have gone on to Nantucket, New Bedford, Sag Harbor, New London, and other American ports, and lived like wanderers in foreign lands. What a pity. Not only was a physical change, but it was such a change to their lifestyle, to their spirit. And we have a feeling that uh, when their spirit was broken by uh, being thrust into a totally different culture, that they were more susceptible to diseases. Illnesses like measles, curable in the Western world, had by now ravaged the Hawaiian population, which had no immunity. When the um, uh, diseases came in, not only were the Kahuna Lapa'au at a loss, but so were the doctors. The uh, mainland uh, missionary doctors who came in at that time were not able to cure or prevent. Uh, eventually smallpox, she has measles, mumps, and all that. And some of our fine chiefs and uh, thousands of people died from those diseases. Specialists have studied the depopulation of the islands and point out that uh, these epidemics cannot entirely account for the decline in the population. And we know from individual anecdotal experiences that many Hawaiians chose no longer to, to live in an environment which they found to be so 
hostile, in which there was no longer uh, hope for a meaningful life. In less than 100 years, the Hawaiian population, estimated at 300,000 when Cook arrived, plunged to less than 60,000 by 1870. In the years 1850 to 1853 alone, 11,000 Hawaiians died. This rapid decline in the Hawaiian population came at a time when the need for labor became acute. Because of the mahele, sugar companies could now buy large tracts of land and more workers were needed. Hawaiians did almost all the plantation labor in the early years, but the declining native population couldn't keep up with the industry's growth. Shiploads of immigrant laborers from China, Japan, and later the Philippines were brought in, forever changing the ethnic makeup of the islands. These people contributed to an incredible growth in sugar. The 500,000 pounds produced from 1855 to 1857 multiplied into 19 million pounds from 1870 to 1872 a 37 times increase. When you, have, when you uh, produce sugar, you have to sell it. People aren't coming to you to buy it. You have to sell it. You have to arrange some sort of trade treaty to, in order to sell it. So this was a period of economic transition uh, for Kamehameha IV, and it uh, went on to the, to the uh, time of Kamehameha V, who reigned from 1863 to 1872. Sugar planters were clamoring for a reciprocity treaty with the United States, an agreement that would allow Hawaiian sugar to be sold in America without the heavy duties attached to foreign products. One Honolulu businessman said the whole plantation system would be ruined without a reciprocity treaty. Alexander Liholiho, Kamehameha IV, worked to secure an agreement, but all efforts failed. In 1863, shattered by the death of his infant son, he died without naming an heir. So his elder brother, Lot, became Kamehameha V. And more years of negotiation failed at reciprocity. A bachelor, Kamehameha V died in 1872, and the Kamehameha dynasty was gone. A cousin, William Lunalilo, became Hawaii's first elected monarch. Immensely popular, the people's king was unable to formulate an acceptable treaty before his untimely death. Hawaii's kings worked in vain for reciprocity. Then, David Kalakaua ascended the throne. He went to uh, Washington. He met the members of Congress. He was entertained at the White House. He was a great, he made a great hit. He and President Grant uh, hit it off beautifully together. And he did what hadn't been able, nobody had been able to do for 25 years. He had got the Senate to pass the reciprocity treaty, which produced a boom in sugar here in the islands. Kalakaua's successful negotiation of the treaty and the designation of his sister as heir apparent secured both the well-being of his kingdom's economy and the succession of his line. The next thing he wanted to do was to popularize the monarchy and not for his own aggrandizement, but to build up the pride of his people, of the Hawaiian people in, their, uh, mo in the monarchy, in their chiefs, in their way of life. And to do this, he did a number of things. He um, brought in new technology. He also uh, went back to the old myths. He wrote a book on the myths and legends of Hawaii. He uh, was a patron of the hula and chants. Uh, he was a collector of Hawaiian artifacts, many of which we hope to have here at the palace uh, later on on display. He uh, took a world tour to find out what firsthand, what, what other uh, monarchs were doing. Also to look into uh, the possibility of labor from the various 
sources around the world. He uh, espoused education, public health, and he built Iolani Palace. Iolani Palace is the most vivid example of Kalakaua's Victorian optimism. But in so many more ways, he was truly a Renaissance man. As the first reigning monarch to circumnavigate the globe, Kalakaua quickly grasped new technologies and the advantages of alliances with other royal households. He even sought betrothal of his niece, Kaiulani, to the Crown Prince of Japan. During his reign, the electric light was introduced. A streetcar system launched public transportation, and the nation's second telephone system connected Iolani Palace with the king's boathouse. Kalakaua built an opera house, completed Ali'iolani Hale, the country's first government building. He built schools, hospitals, and without regard to the attitudes of the missionaries, revoked the ban on hula and reinstated the dance to its rightful position as premier among Hawaiian entertainments. And for himself and his family, he provided the most elaborate Victorian fashion money could buy. He had been well educated, but more than that, he was ambitious. He was a self-improver. He developed himself. Uh, and throughout his early life, you, you see him as a, a reacher. And um, if it was necessary to learn to be a great public speaker, he would do that. If it was necessary to uh, speak English beautifully, he would do that. If it was def necessary to uh, uh, develop courtliness, to learn the rules of etiquette flawlessly, uh, although all the chiefs were trained in this area, Klakawa would be brilliant, a brilliant man. And it is he who puts the finishing touches on the romantic Hawaiian monarchy. But the reign of Kalakaua was beset with criticism from all factions. Many Hawaiians saw their king and their government increasingly controlled by strangers. Irritated foreign-born merchants and planters, meanwhile, saw their taxes supporting the king's royal balls, stately dinners, and lavish exchange of gifts between heads of state. Early in 1887, dissident whites, feeling their influence on government policy was restricted, formed a secret organization known as the Hawaiian League. Its purpose was to limit the king's powers. Prominent members included attorney Lauren A. Thurston and judge Sanford B. Dole. Backed by the Honolulu Rifles, the League threatened Kalakaua with violence. On July 1st, the King accepted a reform cabinet, which, five days later, presented for his signature the Constitution of 1887. This document limited voting rights to those who owned property and had a certain income, effectively disenfranchising Native Hawaiians, excluding Asians, and shifting the balance of power to the whites. The king, no longer in command of his military or his veto power, was reduced to a ceremonial figure. The bayonet constitution, as it became known, was implemented while Kalakaua's queen, Kapiolani, and his sister, Princess Liliu Okalani, were en route home from London. In her autobiography, the heir apparent Liliu Okalani recalled, We arrived in Honolulu on the 26th day of July, 1887. A conspiracy against the peace of the Hawaiian Kingdom had been taking place since spring. It assumed no less definite shape than the overthrow of the monarchy. King Kalakaua, my brother, appeared bright and glad to welcome us back. Yet we could see in his countenance traces of the terrible strain through which he had passed. Although it was only the commencement 
of the troubles preparing for our family and nation. The power of the monarchy continued to erode. The reform cabinet renewed the reciprocity treaty and also granted, over Klaakoa's objections, exclusive right to lease Pearl Harbor to the United States. Meanwhile, in the U.S. Congress, a bill was being proposed to protect American domestic sugar. The McKinley Tariff threatened to devastate Hawaii's one-crop economy. Against this backdrop, Kalakaua's health began to fail. He sailed for San Francisco to rest. But in California, Kalakaua weakened and died. Honolulu Harbor was festively decorated for his return. But on January 29, 1891, the USS Charleston rounded Diamond Head with its American and Hawaiian flags lowered to half-mast, its spars draped in black, and the king's body aboard. As news of the king's death spread throughout Honolulu, the reformed cabinet rushed to Iolani Palace to require Liliu Okalani to swear her allegiance to the Constitution of 1887. I was so overcome by the death of my brother that I hardly realized what was going on around me. I turned to my husband and inquired, what is the object of this meeting? He said, they had come to witness my taking the oath of office. Then I realized I was compelled to take the oath to the Constitution which had led to the death of my brother. Although second in line of succession after her younger brother, Lele Yohoku, who died in 1877, Liliu Kalani, at the age of 52, and while still in mourning, was proclaimed queen of the Hawaiian Islands. Among her first acts, she demanded and received resignations from the reform cabinet, entitled her husband, John Owen Dominus, as his Royal Highness the Prince Consort. And as she and her brothers were childless, like the Kamehamehas before them, secured the Kalakaua line by naming her 15-year-old niece, Kaiulani, as heir apparent. Sadly, the strikingly beautiful daughter of the Queen's sister, Princess Like Like and Scotsman Archibald Cleghorn, on whom the royal line depended, would die unmarried in 1899. Meanwhile, in April of 1891, the much-feared McKinley Tariff went into effect subsidizing American domestic sugar by two cents a pound, eliminating duty on foreign imports, and giving foreign sugar producing countries the same advantage Hawaii had enjoyed exclusively. Lost revenues in the island sugar industry approached four million dollars the first year. Two cents a pound became the rallying cry for those who favored annexation of Hawaii to the United States as the only solution to the sugar crisis. The economy of the islands was tightly tied to the Hawaiian, I mean, to the United States economy. So that uh, politically, economically, in every way, Hawaii had been drawn closer and closer into the U.S. orbit. The Queen sought to regain the monarchical control lost in the Bayonet Constitution. To do that, she needed a strong cabinet, but the legislature repeatedly voted down her choices. Then, in this turmoil, her husband, John Dominus, died, leaving her to face Hawaii's future alone. She also found that she had lack of support from her, the Hawaiian leaders, uh, leaders of the Hawaiian community who should have backed her up. Uh, whom she would assume would back her up, but who didn't. By, the time, by that time, the, the pressures from the foreign 
uh, uh, business people were overpowering. Uh, they'd built up to uh, such an extent that there was just no controlling them. And the um, American businessmen uh, felt that they, the only thing, that their only solution, uh, the only salvation for their economic lifestyle was to uh, change the government, the form of government. In response to petitions from her people, Liliu Okalani worked feverishly to prepare a constitution which would restore monarchical power. But she was betrayed by her own attorney general, Arthur Peterson, who made the document known to another secret society, the Annexation Club. A committee of safety was formed from Annexation Club members with the principal goal of directing the overthrow of the monarchy. On January 14, 1893, in the Blue Room at Iolani Palace, Liliu Okalani presented her constitution to her cabinet. They refused to sign. The Queen tried her best. She uh, tried to uh, get a new constitution promulgated. She felt that the constitution that had been forced on her brother, which is known as the Bayonet Constitution, was, uh, it took too much power from the monarchy. The Committee of Safety called upon American Minister John Stevens to land Marines from the USS Boston, a warship anchored at Pearl Harbor. As the American forces formed a line across Iolani Palace grounds, the infamous committee members entered the palace to ask for Lili Okalani's abdication. You have Lili Okalani finding herself in a position where um, to do right, to do what should have been done is almost suicidal to herself and to her government. And you have Lee Okani in a position where uh, compromise is necessary for survival, but where compromise is not possible. And so the monarchy ends. The final act was the invasion of the Kingdom of Hawaii by United States naval forces and which was called properly an act of war by President Grover Cleveland because it violated treaties between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States. The Committee of Safety, members of the Annexation Club, became the provisional government and chose Sanford B. Dole as president. Its goal was to secure annexation to the United States. But if that failed, to create a Republic of Hawaii. January 17, 1893, the day the provisional government was declared, Liliu Okalani retired to her residence at Washington Place, where she drafted this letter of protest to the provisional government and the President of the United States. I, Liliu Okalani, Queen by the grace of God, and under the Constitution, of the Hawaiian Kingdom to hereby solemnly protest against any and all acts done against myself and the constitutional government of the Hawaiian Kingdom by certain persons claiming to have established a provisional government of and for this kingdom. Now, to avoid any collision of armed forces, and perhaps the loss of life, I do, under this protest and impelled by said forces, yield my authority until such time as the government of the United States shall, upon the facts being presented to it, undo the action of its representative and reinstate me in the authority which I claim as the constitutional sovereign of these Hawaiian islands. In 1895, the political firebrand opportunist Robert Wilcox launched an undermanned, undersupplied, and unsuccessful 
counter-revolution. For Wilcox's act, the deposed queen was arrested and charged with treason. Tried in this, her own throne room at Iolani Palace, she was found guilty and sentenced to five years hard labor, subsequently reduced to imprisonment in a solitary room in the palace that had once been her home. Liliu Okalani, a singular woman on whom the tragedy of the Hawaiian race fell, lived 77 years. At her death in 1917, 139 years after the arrival of Cook, fewer than 40,000 Hawaiians survived, a population decrease of almost 90%. The people were gone. The heroes were gone. The religion was gone. The land was gone. The spoken history of 2,000 years was gone. And with her passing, the last Hawaiian hope was gone too. It is the year of the Hawaiian, 1987. In a state of over one million people, pure Hawaiians number 8,244. Only 2,000 speak the Hawaiian language. Hawaiians are in prison, unemployed, on public assistance, and near the bottom of the socio-economic scale. They are strangers in their own land, in their only land. Yet despite the events of the last 200 years, the Hawaiian spirit is alive and fighting to perpetuate the heritage that was almost lost. Fighting to save the land, to revive the language, to pass on the dance. One thing has survived above all else. It is that which contains the history of the Hawaiian people. It is the mele. It has remained because great chanters like Samuel Pua Ha'ahil ensured its continued life by passing it on to a chosen one. He would sit on a chair and I would sit on the floor and look up at him and he would look down and he would chant and he, he doesn't speak English at all, all in Hawaiian. And he would tell me, well, in the olden time, if you are a favorite child, they call you baby. So he said, come, come, baby, come. And, and I would go and sit and look up at him, and he'll say, now, when I chant, you try to imitate. And of course, I understood little Hawaiian, and I would sit, and he would chant. And he said, now you repeat whatever I, I chanted. So I, re, I, I would repeat. But oh, sometimes 
he would make me repeat one or two lines. I don't know, maybe 10, 20 times. And I used to get so bored and I used to tell him, Uncle, are you punishing me because you make me chat, chat? He said, no, no, you have to do it right. If you don't do it right, then you cannot chat. The day of my graduation, the Uniki, after all the, uh, you, we have to go to a certain procedure to uh, Uniki graduate. He called me on a, on a site and with my cousin, and he told me, you know, baby, you know why I was making you do these chants over and over and over? I said, no, I don't. He said, well, because I was giving you all my mana to you, and when you sit up this way, you will take all the mana. And if you, if you, uh, don't have this mana, you will never be a chanter. The gift of Pua Ha'aheo to his niece, Emily Kauizudemeister, was much more than a family heirloom. It is a trust. She is now called Loea, the expert, the teacher of teachers, the single surviving recipient of a long line of hula tradition preserved over the centuries. Here at the Ke'e, the Pa Hula of Hi'iaka at Ha'ena Kauai, Auntie Kaui brings her master students to pay homage to the Hula deity, Laka. The chant, in my chant, it says, Kualono means the are up so high and you could sit over here and look out into the you know the ocean and the mountain as you're back in, in a chant it describes and the birds singing this is a beautiful place to come to and or oh, and meditate oh, you know it's so still In the olden time, they used to um, bring the young girls over here and train them to be hula dancers. Some come at three years old and some come oh, from three years up to 15. And then they come up here to learn hula. When we came before, this place was all full of the, you know, cocoa lao tea, and those that 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 kind. This whole place was full, but now I don't know. They cleared the place. That, you know, in the chant it says you're not supposed to clean this place. It should stay in in it, the wilderness. To the halal, you must learn to uh, uh, chant, and you, there are certain chants you have to chant to allow you to enter. And the, there was this another person inside that would answer your chant. But when you're chanting, and no better, nobody answers your chant, you better turn around and leave because they don't want you in there. The chant. Kauli Lua Ike Anu Owai Ali Ali is one of the three oldest surviving chants from ancient times. The first part it tells about Wai Ali Ali, Mount Wai Ali Ali. It's the wettest spot, I think, in the uh, world. And I didn't go, but my daughter said uh, the plants grow wild because they cannot control, I guess, the uh, wetness of. But the only thing that she uh, noticed was the uh, lehua, 
the lehu, instead of growing big like a tree, they, they were stunted, they, they, they crawl on, and they crawl on the ground. And that's what they call the lehu or makanoi. And she has a picture of that, that uh, lehu. Then, and it t tells how cold uh, Waiale Ali is. The second part is the part he was prophesizing about Hawaii. And now I see that it's, you know, beginning to be a reality. Kauli Lua was composed by the, um, one of the, uh, well, old-time composers. And uh, when they composed Kauli Lua, he prophesied what Hawaii is going to be. And in the chant, it says the, uh, the life of the land is preserved by righteousness. And then he said, this, in the song it says there's a coral. And the coral is just like Hawaii. And in this, uh, the opening, you know, of the coral, all the different nationalities will come to Hawaii. And when they come to Hawaii, we will learn to sit, stay together, you know, live together as one. And uh, the chant tells about, um, um, this man said that there's going to be uh, a school built at uh, Wahila with all, with all this nationality. And now I see at Wahila, they have the uh, East West Center. And so uh, it's a, it says, uh, about the coral and all these other nationality, and they meet at the East West Center, and they, and they will all try to live together as one group in Hawaii. Then the, the altar, the Hawaiian altars will be, be broken. Kamomoku e ka unu. Momoku means broken. Unu are the, um, you know, just altars. Uh, it's going to be broken. But Kauli Lua is more important because nobody, I can say that, that hula, the dance, nobody knows this is something. Nobody knows. I have never, uh, I, I tell my students, but no outsiders know this, what I'm telling you, because it, it's a prophecy. Because, you know, over here, that, uh, by that altar, used to be a, a tiki. It's a rock formation, like this way. It was this way. And I don't know, when I brought the, my first group up here, they cleaned the place. When they cleaned it, they had erosion, and the tiki, the, the rock all fell down. It was a rock formation, and it, it, it was this way, you know. And he had eyes, nose, and the, uh, his mouth. But I, I kept looking, I couldn't see. In the 1970s, the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts studied the teachers of the hula. Of all the kumu and the masters, five were designated lo'ea, those whose knowledge could not be matched, nor ever duplicated. I am the only lo'ea left. There were five of us uh, uh, who, Kawena Fukui, Yolani Luahine, um, Montgomery, and Holt, and me. These four are dead now, and I'm the only lawyer left. When I'm gone, there will be no more lawyer, and we come down to the masters. I'm, my, my standard of Hawaiian is above the masters of the hula. I'll be very honest with you. I'll be, I'm not going to uh, hide. I'm too old to play games. I'll, I'll, I will tell you, if we don't watch out, that will be gone. That will be gone, the Oli. And it is so important. 
Some of these young kids, they think they know it all. They come to the kupuna for information, and what they do, they get smart with the, uh, with the kupunas. And once the kupuna close their mouth, that is the end. The oli, the oral tradition, the most ancient element of Hawaiian culture, becomes mele when it has an accompanying dance to illustrate it, the hula. In modern times, the word mele is used to describe many different things, among them music. To understand oli, mele, and hula today, we must look back through the centuries to what it was before. Um. Hawaiians and Polynesians had a different value system, different aesthetics. They do not have, in their language, a word for music as such. They have a word for poetry, mele. The, the chanting, for example, today is referred to as uh, music. But they're hardly in the sense of uh, what, we, what we term music with musical notes. Uh, they were chanting in the sense of um, uh, telling a story using different modulations of the voice. Well, hula was a way of um, keeping the stories. Um, the hula or the movement of the hula had to have a story accompanying it. So whenever you do a chant, if you're going to do a hula, you must have uh, a chant with it. You just can't do movements without, without chants or without words. And <coughs> therefore, the Hula was the accompaniment of the, uh, of the story. Uh, the story was first of all the most important. And then the hula was the second most important because it helped you remember what the event was. And usually chants were written because of um, important happenings. If Oli and Meli are the history books of Hawaii's people, then hula is the illustration. But today, Hula is also performed to music, which came with the missionaries in 1820. Now comes along the Western influence, okay? And what happened there, I think, is, is they brought into existence a whole new way of looking at music. And it was a very studied, um, um, developed music that went through, you know, the, the full scale and, and, and pitches and, and meter and everything was very studied. And the Hawaiians, and not just the Hawaiians though, I mean, again, all Polynesians, when they were introduced to the Western style, just embraced it. Lorenzo Lyons introduced the gospel hymn to Hawaiians. See, before he came, Hiram Bingham had been working uh, he had been translating hymns at first with the help of uh, William Ellis, who came from, was an English missionary who came from Tahiti. Um, and Hawaiians were trying to learn the music that he wanted them to learn. Somehow it didn't appeal to the Hawaiians, I guess. Uh, when Lyons came, he decided that the gospel hymn would probably appeal to Hawaiians more. And there were good reasons why. They did. Uh, gospel hymns have a great deal of repetition. And it's your simplest form of harmony, but it adapted itself very well to Hawaiian music. So from then on, Hawaiian music started changing. And um, it got fuller, it got richer. And I, I never mean to think that it was, um, you know, the purity of the music was now impure because of this introduction. It made it grow and the Hawaiian music really blossomed, really blossomed um, after the introduction of the hymne, the hymns from the missionaries, and then the Hawaiians took off on their own. recorded these earliest films of Hawaii in 1898, two years before the islands became a territory of the United States. Fascinated by the tropical paradise these images captured, movie makers rushed to her shores, 
inadvertently launching Hawaii's second great wave of musical change. Fascination is easy because it, it is tropical, and and because all of, and their attitude was almost a cellophane attitude. They used raffia skirts, and which were imported here from Tahiti, I imagine, the original ones came from, or in somewhere in the South Pacific. And it was just a, a perception on their part of what they thought the music going pub uh, the movie going public would accept as as a vision uh, or perception of what hawaii was all about <laughs> Hawaiian dance in the 1930s incorporated both ancient and modern steps called hula kui. It is performed here by Helen Deshea Beamer in the early 1930s at her home in Hilo, Hawaii. <laughs> A prolific composer and teacher, Helen Beamer chants for her granddaughter, seven-year-old Winona. Meanwhile, elder surviving teachers, chanters and dancers saw their arts disappearing, unappreciated, and giving way to Hollywood's Hawaiian fantasy. To preserve the dying arts, Yale anthropologist Helen Roberts was commissioned to document the ancient chants with interpreter Thomas Moe Nepo and this Edison recording machine. Roberts combed the islands, seldom finding anyone under the age of 70 who even remembered the melon. She was hired by the territory Territorial Folklore Commission in 1923 came over and uh, under very primitive conditions, relatively speaking, on canoe, horseback, donkey, went to many isolated valleys, areas of the outer islands and uh, collected chants, collected songs too, uh, onto wax cylinders. Her work proved invaluable. These wax cylinders, housed today at the Bishop Museum, are the oldest recordings of Hawaiian mele, the closest we can be to pre-contact chant. One of the great chanters and teachers of the 1900s, recorded by Roberts, was a koni mika. These people did not speak English, and she had an interpreter with her. Uh, at first, they did not want to give a whole lot, but then uh, they loosened up and realized that they pretty much kept the tradition up to that point, and with what they could foresee, it really was not going to have the place, chant was not going to have the place in the future world that it did in their world. And to keep it for future generations, they gave. Tradition was giving way to an English language vision of Hawaii. By the 1930s, luxurious mats and liners steamed to the islands, laden with visitors in search of an exotic silver screen image of paradise. And they were met on boat days by musicians, hula girls, lay sellers, and a growing industry eager to fulfill their romantic dreams. Well, without a doubt, the um, tourist industry influenced a great uh, number of uh, entertainers, people who were composing music and so on, because there were all these people to entertain. But eventually they had to move into the English language, of course, because 
tourists didn't understand Hawaiian. And so we have what we call the hapahaole. We can, we can define it in the two words, but hapa and haole, uh, meaning foreign, and half and half, it could mean uh, many things. And I, I think that it, it was a term devised to cover non-traditional Hawaiian music, songs like Beyond the Reef, but years and years before Beyond the Reef also. Uh, songs like uh, What Am I Gonna Do With My Red Opu, an English set of lyrics combining a, a Hawaiian phrase. Nothing thrust Hawaii onto the world stage as profoundly as the Pearl Harbor attack in 1941. The outbreak of war also precipitated an influx of mainlanders, servicemen who overran Honolulu, looking for relaxation and entertainment. The sound of the waves is on the beach at Waikiki, and these old Hawaiian words mean welcome as Hawaii calls. And beyond the islands, Hawaii reached the living rooms and imaginations of America through radio. So popular was this weekly program that Harry Owens, its first musical director, launched his own television show. saxophones, he had violins, he had uh, Clara Inter, uh, Hilo Hattie, and he had the, uh, uh, the additional plus of being on television. You could see it. A great night to go back to the old songs, the old melodies, the old chants of old Hawaii. So from the Hawaiian Islands, land of summertime eternal, the trade winds send out a hearty invitation clear across the blue Pacific to you. And it was a marvelous show because it exposed Hawaii. And he stayed with Apahawi music. And he stayed with the big songs. And he stayed with uh, the Hawaiian war chant, you know, things that, that gave you, gave the viewer a view that we were out in the middle of the Pacific in the tropics. And we had these war dances and the drums and the spears and the uh, really Polynesian look to us. By the 1950s, new styles were emerging. Luau style, or Chalang Lang, featured ukulele, acoustic bass, and guitar. For many Hawaiians, the music was their only contact with their language, because by the 1950s, English had become the predominant language spoken in the islands. The growing attractiveness of, of Western culture, the increasing interaction of the Hawaiian peoples with outsiders, and by that we mean uh, overseas outsiders coming to Hawaii, with the decline in pure numbers of the Hawaiian people, with the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy in 1893, with the decree around the turn of the century, 
year 1900 or so that henceforth all instruction in government schools must be conducted in the English language. All of these reasons, among others, hastened the decline of the Hawaiian language to the point where Hawaiian parents didn't want their children to learn the Hawaiian language because they felt that they would get further ahead in the new world by being able to, to handle English well. So the emphasis was upon English and Hawaiian was, was given secondary status by the Hawaiians themselves. Also, well, my parents talked Hawaiian, they spoke Hawaiian, but it was a secret language between them and not for us. Uh, they taught us a few words, some phrases, and of course when they wanted us to keep quiet, you know what they said, uh, we understood that word very early, um, kuli kuli. Um, but other than that, you know, it was get busy and learn all those things you're going to be taught in school because that's what's important. Uh, later on, my father wanted to send me to Kamehameha. He sent my brother there. My father was a graduate of Kamehameha, but I did not want to go to Kamehameha. Instead, I went to McKinley. And uh, in McKinley, I believe I learned more Hawaiian culture, Hawaiian history, Hawaiian language than I could have learned at Kamehameha at that time. At Kamehameha at that time, they discouraged the use of the Hawaiian language. Students who spoke the Hawaiian language students who had musical instruments in their rooms and so forth were punished. Over the first half of the 20th century, many aspects of Hawaii's unique culture became endangered. With the decline of the language and the chants of old, traditional hula was threatened. I remember when classes were very, very small, when, when Auntie Wakale's class was very small, when Auntie Io had only one student. And I remember when um, lots of the hula studios had, you know, you could count on one hand how many students they had. It was a time where, where they weren't men hula dancers. They weren't, um, it was just unheard of or, you know, it was, it was not the in thing to be a hula dancer. Between the 30s and the 60s, a lot of this died. I think there was a lot of pressure from the social community not to do it. It wasn't valued. There was no need for it. And you'll hear a lot of people who were young in the 30s and 40s saying today that we weren't encouraged to speak Hawaiian. We weren't encouraged to compose in Hawaiian. I, everything in those days was, was jazz and big band. It was right before the world, the World War. It was very patriotic, it, it, was, it was American. With the advent of statehood in 1959, visitors invaded the islands in unprecedented numbers, launching a period of growth and development that marked the decade of the 60s. Showrooms and supper clubs offered new venues for Hawaii's talent. Tourism provided a livelihood for entertainers and inspired new music that reflected the sound and polish of mainland entertainers. Gifted composers like Kui Lee wrote haunting lyrics, songs popularized nationally by the enormous success of Don Ho, but songs that could have been written anywhere. Music of the mainstream. Every bright star we may wish this upon. Love me always, promise always. You'll remember too. Outside influences were not the visitors, they were. Uh, entertainers like Andy Williams that did the English version of Charles King's Hawaiian wedding song, the Kekalaneau. It became a giant all over the world. Um, 
Elvis Presley doing Blue Hawaii and Rockahula Baby. And Rockahula Baby would have been called a Hapahali song, for sure. And uh, Leon Pober, who wrote Tiny Bubbles, which is certainly not a Hawaiian song, but it became one because Don Ho made it one. And then Leon Pober also wrote Pearly Shells, which is Pupu Ao Eva. And so we had all of these uh, outside influences that, that made the local musicians and writers and entertainers aware that outside uh, of our islands, there were people who were doing what we were supposed to be doing. Just at the height of polyester leisure suits, pearly shells, and the cosmetic Elvis era, something snapped in Hawaii. A fresh new voice was heard clearly above all the slick brass sections. Led by middle-aged Pied Piper on slack key guitar, young Hawaiians turned to a new music. But was it really all that new? Gabby really paved the way in the early 70s as a figurehead for the musical renaissance uh, and mainly because I think the young people in Hawaii needed something to identify themselves you know it was a period of question it was a Vietnam War it was grassroots I think Hawaiian traditional music at that time mirrored uh, American pop music you know like Gabby and Joan Baez and Buffy St. Marie he spoke of this is the real stuff man this is the old man down in Waimanalo with the chickens this is the real stuff. This is how Hawaii should be. So when Gabby put out an album, bang, a thousand something people would show up at a Sears autograph session. Gabby Pahinui ignited Hawaii's young people who flocked to him to study and learn. Among them, guitarist Peter Moon, who, together with youthful musicians like Robert and Roland Casimero, sang traditional music and songs which remembered and praised Hawaii's past. Credited with launching a renaissance in Hawaiian culture, they were the Sunday Manoa. Uh, it was a real shock, first of all, to have to see people standing in line to come and see us. At the time, Roland, Peter, and I were, when we sort of like made it, or, or were starting to make it, we were at a place called Chuck Cellar on Lures, and Don Ho was above us in the Polynesian Palace. And we were used to having lines for, for him. And one night we came and the line was for us. And that was pretty much right after our first album, Guava Jam. By the mid-70s, the musical renaissance in Hawaii was well underway. Young musicians, composing, performing, and recording in the Hawaiian language, dominated the music scene. Eddie Kamai and the Sons of Hawaii, the Peter Moon Band, the brothers Casimero, Olomana, and Polani Vaughn performed to packed houses and revitalized the recording industry, which by 1979 reached an all-time sales high with Keola and Kapono Beamer's Honolulu City Lights. Looking out upon the sea. The stars above the ocean Got my ticket for the midnight plane And it's not easy to leave again The successful return to more traditional Hawaiian music greatly affected other aspects of Hawaiian culture. Hilo's Merry Monarch Hula Festival, begun in the early 60s as a means to attract visitors, played to turn away audiences in the late 70s due to a resurgence of interest in hula. 
in a heightened awareness of their Hawaiian-ness, young Hawaiians eagerly began to learn about themselves and their heritage. In our generation, that when we looked around and saw that so much was being lost, that we had to figure out how can we, you know, hold on to what little we have left, and and realizing that um, there were resources outside of Honolulu that we could draw upon as people began to share. Land was the most obvious loss. The destruction of sacred sites by development, or in the case of Koho'olawe, by military bombing, went unacknowledged. Aloha Aina, love the land, was the rallying cry. In music was the message. Well, you tired and worn, you woke up this morning and found that I was confused. Spun right around and found I had lost things that I couldn't lose. Like the beaches they sell to build a hotel that my fathers and I once knew. And the birds all along the sunlight at dawn singing on the cool blue. Our culture is living in these real communities, and if they are destroyed, our Hawaiian culture will be destroyed, our Hawaiian people will be destroyed, our chance to regroup as a Hawaiian nation will be destroyed. So I believe it's very important to protect Molokai and Ka'u and Puna and Ni'ihau and Waimea and Hana and Haula and Kahana on this island because if we don't protect those areas we will have nothing left of our culture and our people. Come down with me Have you ever tripped through reality? Come down with me Come down and see Come see what they've done to Waikiki and ask me why won't you open your eyes can't you see we lost our paradise there's too many people not in our sand can they see we want the result of this era of cultural renaissance and political activism was that young Hawaiians effectively stopped the total erosion of their identity as Hawaiians look to their past for identity, Kaulana Napua, perhaps Hawaii's ultimate protest song, written for Liliu Kalani at the time of her overthrow, became an anthem for the young. Kaulana Napua, famous are the flowers, the people of Hawaii. In seeking their past and the ancient practices, Hawaiians turned to surviving links to that past, the elders, kupuna. Like the scholar and teacher, Mary Kavena Pukui, filmed in the 1930s, chanting in Himene style. <laughs> Pukui's unparalleled knowledge and writings resulted from her immersion in the culture of Ka'u on the Big Island. To perfect a skill or art form, Hawaiians often taught through total immersion. In the dance, it was called hula kapu, when a child was taken from its parents to be raised by hula teachers. That child's life would be devoted to the hula, the dominant deity of that hula tradition. The child would never belong to himself. He was hula kapu, 
he belonged to that deity forever. One product of the hula couple was Loea, Iolani Luahine. for just countless people and all kinds of people but my most uh, memorable person to make lays for him that was very exciting for me was Auntie Eel because she did the traditional dances and uh, because of the traditional dances she needed traditional lays I if you trust the oral traditions and the way that it's passed down, then if you have been a recipient of a long line of kumuhula, then what you have learned is valid. And it is true. Also realizing that through all of these lines of passing down, there have been changes. There have been things that have been forgotten, things that have been added and created. But what has come down to you is valid, and it is true. Okay, it is the truth to you. The other person who has been the recipient of a long line, what has come down to them, it is the truth to them. Now, these truths may not match. One such recipient of a long line of oral tradition was Kumu Hula Edith Kanaka Ole, whose hula lineage extends back to the goddess Pele. Of all her children, her daughters, Nalani and Puolani, chose the way of hula. She also said that it's, it won't be her place to choose one of us to, to carry on the tradition. It's up to us, and if we are interested enough, we will come there and participate in what she's doing. And so we showed some interest and came and participated and, and grew because we did that. Grew in knowledge, etc. cetera. Um, and therefore, when, when she did die, we felt like we were prepared to, to carry on. We weren't, you know, we weren't terribly sorry or regretful that we didn't do anything uh, when she was here. Um, I don't think uh, that we'll be as good as my mother, you know, in many things and in many ways. She just lived in a different time, and um, the, the, the way she learned was a little bit different. We came from a different time also, and we learn a little bit different. But hopefully we pick up on the kinds of things that she learned, and she then picked up on the kinds of things that her mother learned. And some of this will eventually be passed on. It is time itself that is passing on. And the few kupuna, the few surviving links with the old ways, will pass with it. I don't think that they know that they're going to die, but they have, you know, a rush come over that, that I have all of this and I want to give it to someone. I will leave my knowledge. I will sit and look who I want to give my knowledge. I'm not, you know, I want to give somebody that, you know, would appreciate the, what I'm telling you folks. If I stand and I look and I, I feel I don't want to, I won't. Well, you never really pass on all your knowledge. You always keep a little bit. There's always a little bit that's lost because that's what makes you the master. You always know more than your student. And that's one way of doing it, not giving everything you know. Um, and when you die, that part of the hula or whatever you're trained in will die with you. If this, this tradition is lost, to me it's, a, it's of greater value than an heirloom because an heirloom is tangible, something that you can touch. Uh, it's, it's materialistic. Um, to me, this, the tradition has to do with knowledge. And knowledge, once it's lost, you know, cannot be regained. And Lua, huh? I only, I only have it.
Near extinction of the Hawaiian language has made the complete revival of traditional culture almost impossible for younger generations. Today's Hawaiian language speakers are not primarily native speakers. The language is studied. It is not vital, growing, or changing. If your mindset is Western, and you learn Hawaiian words, and you learn the Hawaiian words in the context of the translation to Western concepts, and if you write that way, musically, you're going to have a Hawaiian song that was still written in a Western mode, a Western frame of mind. For example, someone called me and said, how would you translate the last rose of summer in Hawaiian? Now, basically, you can do that. You can just take those words and translate them to Hawaiian. But it's not Hawaiian. First of all, a rose is not Hawaiian. And there is no phrase in the Hawaiian language that says the last rose of summer. It'd have to be turned around to maybe like as the mango falls from the tree, you know? That's basically the difference. We are thinking in English terms today as compared to thinking Hawaiian. I think that our generation is coming together and taking a stand to perpetuate our people. We're taking a stand to learn our language, which had been taken away from us, so that our culture can live. Because our language is, contains our philosophy, our worldview, our way of thinking, our traditional concepts. And so in order to be Hawaiian, we have to think Hawaiian, and that means in Hawaiian. <laughs> Another reflection of the ongoing struggle to perpetuate the heritage in the face of modern reality is seen in Hawaii's recording industry. The tragedy of our music business and where it is going is that no one knows where to take it because the visitor doesn't know what he wants to hear. So we must stumble in trying to invent a new form that goes beyond uh, cane fire and goes beyond uh, Waikiki, my castle by the sea, and gets expanded. And we have marvelous gauges for that, and it's the record business. And there is very, the record business here has diminished, and it keeps sliding. The traditional Hawaiian music is still being performed and recorded by a lot of local, young local groups, but as far as we're concerned, the Peter Moon Band, we've had to diversify. So on any given album in the past six years, our album, you'll find reggae, an English ballad, a traditional Hawaiian uh, lyrical song, and, and, you know, rock and roll. Because we had to, we've had to target different audiences to sell albums. Move with me to the slacky samba. Move with me, my sexy mama. I give to you my brand new rhythm, the slacky samba. Forget about the other dancers, their rigid moves. And one night romances loosen to my body language. To I think that the Hawaiian samba. entertainer will become more important than the material he does. And the example is uh, young Mr. Madeira's from Kauai. He's a local kid singing a mainland type song. He could not have made it if he sang a Hapahawi tune or a contemporary Hawaiian song. He would have had to do what, exactly what he did do. It, he sang a pop song that is acceptable in Pennsylvania acceptable in Germany, acceptable anywhere in the world. But there is a continuing commitment on the part of Hawaiian musicians to perform and record Hawaiian music. Whether it's the old hapahaole standards, traditional Hawaiian songs, or a combination of both.
modern composers are still writing music in much the same style that defined Hapa Hauli music decades ago. Although today, it's known by the more acceptable modern term, contemporary Hawaiian. I think people today look at Hapa Hauli music as, as the, 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 the slinky steel guitar, the white sand beach image, or the beautiful hula girl. Uh, whereas contemporary uh, Hawaiian music, we look at it as uh, Island Love or Cane Fire or Honolulu City Lights. Hawaiian songs are songs about Hawaii with English lyrics instead of Hawaiian. Yes, I'm a contemporary lover. I love bebop in the music, but I hope uh, the younger kids uh, learn all the old standards that we did because it's uh, very important. Um, we wouldn't be where we are if we, um, if we hadn't learned those songs, you know? And they shouldn't be forgotten, you know? Um, I'm all for the contemporary and writing new songs and taking that down that road, but, you know, I really miss uh, the old shalang, shalang players, and there's not too many of them coming out anymore. Not too many young kids are really interested in that, and that, to me, is sad. And because I've helped to push it away from that, you know, and um, I'm doing my best to push it back the other way. I just hope that our young people can preserve the literature that already exists and that, provided the Hawaiian language goes on, that we continue to sing the songs of Hawaii. You see, I think it's important because a lot of places that Hawaiians sang about are disappearing under progress and concrete. And I think one of the ways that we will have to remember these places is through the songs. The song, the mele, brings us full circle in our Hawaiian story. Ancient Polynesians brought with them to Hawaii the chanted memories of their history. What remains of the ancients can be found in the rich poetry of Oli. And what binds today's Hawaiian to his Polynesian past is that same thread. Today's version of Mele is not memorized or chanted. It is written. But the song retains the memory. And it is in remembering, in holding fast to the places, the legends, the language and song, that the people themselves will live.
Today on Spectrum Hawaii, we visit Honolulu.